All right, so our first lecture for medical biochemistry is going to be on vitamins and minerals. And so vitamins, you need to understand, are important because they are actually coenzymes, which means they help our enzymes work in many different processes in your body. There are two general classes of vitamins. We have our water-soluble vitamins, which means they can move through the blood rather easily. It doesn't mean they, they move freely, but they are water soluble. And then we have our fat soluble vitamins. And this means they have to sort of be packaged into particles in order to move through our blood. And so remember our four fat soluble, vitamin A, D, K, and E. And then all the other vitamins fall into the water soluble category. Now I just wanna point out that fat soluble vitamins, we take them in our diet, all the vitamins and the fat-soluble vitamins are going to initially be packaged into lipid particles called chylomicrons. And these are lipid particles that are going to move around not only fat-soluble vitamins, but also any fats that you take in your diet. So these lipid particles will bring all of these to the liver and sometimes to the adipose tissue and deliver them. One other thing to point out about fat-soluble is because um, they can be stored they can accumulate and lead to toxicity. So you always want to make sure that you don't take these vitamins in excess. Now, the first vitamin we'll talk about is going to be folic acid. And folic acid is, of course, important because it's going to be necessary for amino acid and purine synthesis. And what this means is basically you need folic acid to make your um, purines, so for RNA, for DNA, as well as for ATP. All of them are going to require folic acid. Folic acid deficiencies are going to lead to macrocytic anemia, and macrocytic anemia is often referred to as megoblastic anemia, and this is where the cytoplasm is going to, um, is going to develop faster than the nucleus. Now, you can have a folate deficiency due to, to, to demand, and this is in pregnancy, or for poor absorption, and this could be alcoholism. And for pregnancy, you will treat with supplements. However, for adults, non-pregnant adults, you don't treat with supplements because Supplements can mask a potential vitamin B12 deficiency, which would have to be treated different. So usually for poor absorption, you would um, go back to diet and try to change someone's diet, try to um, make them not drink as much alcohol so they can absorb the nutrients that they need. Two important um, uh, diseases associated with folic acid are, of course, spina bifida, which is a neural tube defect, and also anencephaly. Anencephaly is the absence of the major portion of the brain and skull. And anencephaly is where you have the rostral or the head end of the neural tube will fail to close between the 23rd and 26th day following conception. Now here's just a picture of the folic acid and why it's important. So in your diet, you take up folic acid you have dihydrofolate-reductase, dihydrofolate-reductase, two reactions, um, and these are going to generate our tetrahydrofolate pool. This is a single carbon donor pool. And so you can see there's going to be different varieties of tetrahydrofolates. You don't have to memorize them now, but what you do have to know is that you're going to be important for purine synthesis, as we talked about also important for the generation of non-essential um, amino acids, such as serine, and also for recycling methionine from homocysteine. Now, a treatment for psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and neoplastic diseases is going to be methotrexate, and methotrexate blocks dihydrofolate reductase, which reduces the single carbon pool of tetrahydrofolate which reduces purine synthesis and doesn't allow 
um, your immune system, your autoimmune system and rheumatoid arthritis to divide. It doesn't allow the neoplastic cells to divide and it doesn't allow your autoimmune re reaction to psoriasis divide. So it's basically trying to um, stop the replication of cells that are causing the actual disease. Now next up is vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is going to be important for two reactions. So again, we have that homocysteine to methionine, which required our tetrahydrofolate, um, as well as vitamin B12. And so the second reaction is when you have odd number of fatty acids, which we take in our diet. So we have odd number 13, 15, something like that, fatty acids. Um, and this is going to generate a methionyl CoA, and you need vitamin B12 to convert that to succinyl CoA, and succinyl CoA can then, of course, go on to make ATP through the TCA cycle or go do something else. So those are the two key reactions for vitamin B12. Now, one of the signals that you have a vitamin B12 deficiency is the accumulation of methionyl CoA which will lead to an increase of methylmalononic acid in the blood. And so this is diagnostic for a vitamin B12 deficiency. Now vitamin B12 deficiency is going to be characterized mostly by malabsorption. Vitamin B12 is water soluble, it is stored, and it can take about a, a long time, so it has about months to years Of storage and so it can take a long time to develop a deficiency. One deficiency that is associated with vitamin B12 is pernicious anemia and this is an autoimmune disease in which your parietal cells are de depleted. And so your parietal cells are part of your stomach and your parietal cells are going to be a, they're going to release many things, but one thing they release for vitamin B12 is something called intrinsic factor. So IF equals intrinsic factor. Now your vitamin B12 bound to intrinsic factor is how your vitamin B12 gets into your body. So your vitamin B12 enters your stomach, binds to the R protein, shown here. The R protein will transport vitamin B12 through the stomach, through the stomach acid. And then once it gets into the small intestine, your vitamin B12 will be released from the R protein, bind to intrinsic factor. And intrinsic factor will bind to the epithelial cells and deliver vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 will then be picked up by the B12 binding proteins and these will take B12 to the liver where they will be restored. Now, if you do have pernicious anemia, you will be given treatments of high doses of vitamin B12. And so in general, without intrinsic factor, you can absorb about 1% of the vitamin B12 you take, or you can be given a sanocalbulin injection. All right, so next up is ascorbic acid or vitamin C. So the famous disease is scurvy. And so the, these people on ships would have really bad teeth because they did not have citrus fruits for long periods of time, which is a good source of vitamin C. Vitamin C is important for collagen um, hydroxylation. And so it's going to be important for the integrity of the connective tissue. And so, of course, in your mouth, your gums have a lot of connective tissue, and when you don't have vitamin C, the connective tissue breaks down, and that loosens the bone, which are your teeth, and then the, the teeth begin to fall out. It is also important for wound healing, so a deficiency will um, lead to um, a decrease or an increase in wound healing time.
Um, it is associated with microcytic anemia. Microcytic means that this red blood cells are too small. And this is not directly related to vitamin C's effect on blood cells. This is due to a effect on iron absorption. Now iron is typically taken up in a ferric state. You eat it in uh, and you take it into your body in a ferric state. It has to be absorbed as a ferrous state. And so vitamin C helps to convert that ferric iron to ferrous, and then you can absorb the iron. And so if you don't get enough iron, you're going to have microcytic anemia. Now next up is going to be our vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 is important for a coenzyme called pyridoxal phosphate, PLP. And this is going to be needed for many reactions, including reactions that move nitrogens. And those are transamination reactions. Remove nitrogens. And those are deamination reactions, which is important because we have a lot of proteins and sometimes we have to degrade the proteins. So we need to remove those nitrogens. Decarboxylation reactions and condensation reactions will also use PLP. Now vitamin B6 is water soluble, but it is the only one associated with severe to toxicity. So you need, oops, sorry, you need about 800, sorry, you need, um, well, anyways, 1,000, let's start this way, 1,000 milligrams per day is toxic. And so this is actually quite a bit. So you, you don't need that much. This is about 800 times what is actually needed on a daily intake. And so if you do take in large amounts of vitamin B6, this will lead to what's called sensory neuropathy. And this leads to pain, numbness in your extremities with difficulty to walk. Now, you can also have deficiencies, which is associated with seboric dermatitis, as well as microcytic anemia again, and you have epileptic-like convulsions as well as depression and confusion. Thiamine is vitamin B1. Thiamine will generate thiamine um, pyrophosphate, and the pyrophosphate are two phosphates that were delivered from ATP, so you take the two phosphates, add it to thiamine, um, and you get thiamine pyrophosphate. Now, thiamine is going to be important in the pentose phosphate pathway. And this is going to give you that ribose 5-phosphate, which is important for making DNA, RNA, ATP, etc. It is also going to be critical for two reactions in metabolism. The first is going to be from converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA to enter the TCA cycle to make ATP. There is also alpha-ketoglutarate to succinyl-CoA, which requires TPP as part of the TCA cycle, again, to generate ATP. So this is really linked to metabolism, energy formation, and so one of the key organs that gets affected is the CNS. Because in general, if you can't do this first reaction, you're basically um, making the cell rely on glycolysis for ATP only, and the brain needs too much energy, and so it will be greatly affected by this. There are two diseases associated with thiamine deficiencies, there's Burberry disease and Wernicke korsakoff disease. Burberry disease has three different variants. There's a wet, dry, and acute. For the wet disease, it's mostly going to be associated with cardiovascular. And this is going to lead to symptoms similar to other cardiovascular disease, where you have a fast heart rate. 
And then you're also going to have shortness of breath. And you're going to have the leg swelling, accumulation of fluid in the legs. And then dry beriberi is going to affect the nervous system. And this is going to lead to numbness of your hands and feet and confusion. Acute beriberi occurs in babies, and it's, it's usually going to be associated with a loss of appetite. And it's going to have vomiting, lactic acidosis, and an enlarged heart. Dry and wet beriberi are usually associated with severe chronic deficiencies. Of vitamin B12. And so the baby is called acute because the babies haven't been born very long and so they're not a chronic deficiency. It's, it's a very um, acute or current deficiency. Now risk factors for beriberi are going to be a white rice diet And it's going to be alcoholism. And it's going to be on dialysis because your kidneys are important for excreting, but they're also important for reabsorbing. And if you're on diuretics. Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome is going to be associated with chronic alcoholism. And this lack of vitamin B1 can be caused by um, impaired absorption. Or dietary insufficiency. Now next up is we have niacin. Niacin is nicotinic acid and it's going to create, it's going to generate two critical cofactors, NAD and NADP. And you can see niacin or nicotinic acid will become in your diet and this is going to generate first NAD and then you transfer a phosphate to that um, two position and you get NADP. One thing to point out here is tryptophan can compensate for niacin to make NAD. Now, niacin deficiency is critical, um, but as I said before, tryptophan can uh, compensate. One dis a very important disease is pellagra, and pellagra is going to be associated with pigmented rash on your skin. Um, and the um, pigmented rash is um, going to be because you have inflamed skin when it's exposed to ultraviolet light. You also have a bright red tongue, and you have the three Ds as symptoms. You have your um, dermatitis, which is a skin associated, of course. You have your diarrhea, which is your GI tract, and you have your dementia which is, of course, the CNS. And all these three Ds, if not treated, will lead to death. Um, some risks are corn-based diet, and that's because it's low in niacin and low in tryptophan. Another thing that can happen is, so here's risk, is you can also have an increase or an excess of leucine. And leucine will inhibit the formation of NAD.
Next up we have is going to be um, riboflavin. And riboflavin is vitamin B2. And this is going to be important for two other cofactors, MNM, flavin mononucleotide, and flavin adenine dinucleotide. Um, these are similar to NAD and NADP in that they can move around electrons in the form of hydrogens. So both of these will accept two hydrogens, and both are going to be tightly bound to their flavoenzymes. And this is important because NAD and NADP can move around. They hold on to their hydrogens pretty closely. FAD and FMN cannot move around. They have to be with the enzyme in order to do the reaction immediately because um, they, or else they'll release their hydrogens and they will have, it won't be useful for the actual reaction. Now a deficiency you can have, but um, it's really not that big of a deal or, or as much as some of the other vitamins. You will get sort of a sore throat, hyperemia, um, and it, it's usually associated with a deficiency of some other vitamin as well as not just a B2 um, deficiency. You'll get a normal chromatic, normocytic anemia, which basically means you have normal red blood cells, but too few. Okay, so now into our fat-soluble vitamins. So we're going to start with vitamin A. And vitamin A is very famously known for sight, for vision. But it also has a role in just growth in general. It has a role in maintenance of your epithelial layers, so treatments of retinol for um, skin diseases, for example. And it has a role in immune function as well. So your immune system is going to require retinoic acid. So retinol basically has two different pathways it can take to become a functional variant for our um, use. One is through oxidation and the formation of retinoic acid, and the second is an aldehyde version of retinol, which is retinal. And retinal is very important for vision. Now you can get um, beta carotene from plants, and people know beta carotene is being very important in eyes. And so from beta carotene, you can get two molecules of retinal. And so again, retinal is the version that is used for eyesight. Now, vitamin A is fat soluble. So let's just walk through really quickly what happens to vitamin A when you take it up. So you have some sort of dietary source of vitamin A. And so you can have retinal esters, which are going to be in... Um, different animal tissues or beta carotins in plants. And so your retinal esters cannot be absorbed by your epithelial cells. Beta carotin can. Beta carotin will be absorbed directly by your epithelial cells and will be converted to retinal esters eventually. And then retinal esters have to first be converted to retinol. And so you have to remove the fats associated with those esters from the animal sources and then the retinol will become retinol esters. These are fat soluble, and so they get packaged in that particle we talked about in the beginning, chylomicrons. And then the chylomicrons are going to transport these fats, fat soluble vitamins, etc., to the liver. In the liver, you're going to have the stored form of vitamin A, which is a retinol palmitate. Palmitate is a 16 carbon fat that your liver produces. And so this is the stored form of, of retinol. And then retinol is going to be released by the liver and bind to retinol binding proteins. So at this point, chylomicrons no longer move retinol around. It's the retinol binding proteins that do this. And then the retinol binding proteins will deliver retinol to tissues that need retinol. And so you get rhodopsin, for example, in your eye, and then you get other proteins um, retinoic acid, for example, in immune cells can lead to activation of genes that are important for immune function, for example. Now, for vitamin A, there are some um, deficiencies associated with vitamin A. You have your um, uh, xerothalmia, which is going to be a dryness of the conjunctiva as well as the cornea and the eyes. Um, 
and this is going to be associated with inflammation. Also have dry, scaly skin if you have a deficiency of vitamin A and night blindness, which means you cannot adapt to the darkness. Now too much vitamin A or hypervitaminosis is going to also lead to a disease because this is a stored fat soluble vitamin. So if you take in too much, for one thing, it's gonna take up too much storage and it's gonna alter the metabolism of other fat soluble vitamins. It also is going to, uh, and can induce sickness such as vomiting, liver damage, because again, liver is where it's being um, um, stored. Birth defects have been associated with hypervitaminosis, which is vitamin A, too much high um, vitamin A. Um, just so you know what is required, they are counted in retinal activity equivalents, or RAEs. And an RAE is just really one microgram of retinal. And so males need 900 RAEs, which basically means they need 900 micrograms of retinol a day, whereas females need 700 micrograms of retinol a day. Vitamin D is also fat soluble. Vitamin D your body can make. It will convert sunlight um, using 70 hydroxy hydro sorry cholesterol cholesterol, um, and this will convert it to col calciferol which is vitamin D3, which is also a version that is taken up in the diet. So coal calciferol from the skin or from the diet will go to the liver. And then these will be converted to 25 hydroxy vitamin D3. And then this has to go to the kidney to make the functional form of um, calcium. And so basically you need three different sites to generate um, a active vitamin D in the body, the skin, the liver, and the kidney. Dietary intake, of course, bypasses the skin, but you still need the liver and the kidney to make the functional form. Now, your vitamin D has a hormone-like function. And so what this means, it's a sterile. And so you basically have vitamin D, and it's going to be taken up by a cell. So here's a cell membrane. So it's going to cross the membrane, get in. Um, and then inside the cell is going to have a receptor. So here's the vitamin D receptor in the cytosol. And then it has a sterile function because it can go to the nucleus where you have your DNA. And so the vitamin D plus your receptor will get into the nucleus and it'll become a transcription factor. And a transcription factor will turn on or off genes. And so of course, vitamin D is, is interested in vitamin D metabolism, so it'll turn on and off genes associated with vitamin D and vitamin D metabolism. But it is a steroid-like vitamin, which is kind of interesting. Now, vitamin Ds do have deficiencies. We have nutritional rickets, which is in kids, or osteomalacia in adults. So nutritional rickets occurs when the growth plates are open. And then osteomalacia occurs when the growth plates are closed. And they're both associated with vitamin D deficiencies. And this is going to lead to demineralization. Oops. Of the bone. Uh, and children are going to have stunted growth and can have skeletal deformities. Now, there's also renal um, osteodystrophy, which is where the kidney fails to maintain calcium and phosphor le phosphorus levels in the blood.
And this is common in people who have kidney disease or are on dialysis. So what's happening here is that you have low calcium, but high phosphorus. And so you're going to have treatment is going to, is to increase calcium and decrease phosphorus. Another is hypoparathyroidism, where you have a decrease of the parathyroid hormone. And the symptoms um, are such things as tingling in the fingers, fingertips. Now the next fat soluble vitamin is vitamin K. Vitamin K is critical for blood clotting. And this is because your um, blood clotting proteins are made by your liver. And vitamin K is stored in your liver, like fat soluble vitamins are. And vitamin K is critical for post-translational, sorry, post-translational modification of blood clotting proteins made by the liver. Um, and so the vitamin K is the coenzyme involved in carboxylation reactions of glutamic acid residue on your clotting proteins. And pr the proteins have many glutamic acid residues, and so they have to be carboxylated. All of them have to be carboxylated. Now there's two different versions of vitamin K1 that your body is going to absorb, and it can deal with both of them. So you can have vitamin K1 and this is from plants. And this is the phyloquinone version of vitamin K. And then you have vitamin K2, which is from your normal flora bacteria. And this is the menaquinone version of vitamin K. Now deficiencies are going to be, of course, you have defective blood coagulation, blood, I mean, it's not coagulation, clotting, and so you have enhanced time for clotting to occur, and for it's also associated with hemorrhagic anemia of the newborn. Now one of the big things you need to know about vitamin E, it is the quintessential antioxidant. If you're ever asked a question, which of the following vitamin is an antioxidant, and vitamin E is in the list, regardless of what you think about the other ones, pick vitamin E. Uh, deficiency is going to lead to hemolysis and renopathy, um, and this makes sense because vitamin E really protects your cell membranes. Um, you're, we're going to talk about radical um, oxygen species and things that can damage cell membranes, and once integrity of the cell membrane is compromised, the cell undergoes lysis. And so hemolysis or lysis of your red blood cell makes sense for vitamin E um, deficiencies. Um, deficiencies have been linked also to muscular dystrophy as well as different neurologic disorders. Now your book has these tables on these vitamins that we just discussed. I think I added a few more details to them, um, but feel free to use your tables as well. Now, moving on just really quickly, let's go through our xenobiotics. Our xenobiotics are going to be any compound that your body just does not need. So xenobiotic means that your body cannot use it for energy sources at all. Um, and that's important because most of the things you want to eat and take in, you want to have your body to have access to and use it for something. But xenobiotics have no nutritional value. And they're just listed here, cured meats, Smoke, charred foods, and carcinogens, of course, are all xenobiotics. Let's just talk a little bit about minerals. So we have a table of minerals in which we have some major minerals and we have some trace minerals. So let's just talk about a little bit about these and what they're used for. So phosphorus is going to be, of course, important for ATP. 
So P is for the phosphate, so phosphorus is important for that. Magnesium is going to activate enzymes and complexes with ATP or ADP. So magnesium is always associated with a reaction involving ATP. And um, anything with charges and stuff, magnesium will help to dissipate in just, well, charges as the reactions move forward. And then we have calcium and phosphorus. So we just talked about calcium and phosphorus levels and during deficiencies um, with um, calcium, um, with um, vitamin D metabolism. And so calcium and phosphorus are kind of together and they're important for bone and teeth. Um, and iron is a component of heme, as well as iron-containing um, enzymes. And some of these iron-containing enzymes are actually used um, as a signal for um, iron um, deficiency. So if there is an iron deficiency, oftentimes your red blood cells will be impacted, but these other enzymes will also be impacted and serve as transcription factors to increase iron uptake, for example. Um, and then you have potassium, which is required for blood clotting. Now others, of course, um, sodium is going to be important for osmoregulation. Um, we have um, chloride also for osmoregulation, iodine obviously for your um, thyroid hormones, copper, zinc, all of those at very small levels are going to be important for enzyme reactions, charges, things like that. Now just a little bit about our calcium. So bio biochemical functions of calcium are important in bones and teeth as well as muscle contraction. So calcium is going to combine and phosphate are going to um, make hydroxy appetite and ap this is going to make up about 70% of calcified bone. Muscle contractions are also dependent on calcium. Calcium is going to interact with our troponin protein and trigger muscle contractions. They're also important for activating ATPases and this is going to help drive actin myosin interactions. Okay, so in conclusion, please know which vitamins are fat soluble and water soluble. Know the importance of all the different vitamin deficiencies that were discussed. Understand what is meant by vitamin toxicity and which vitamins are can be toxic. Know the common diseases discussed associated with the vitamins and how they are used in our bodies. And then also know about minerals and chemi the chemical reactions minerals partake in.